Welcome to episode 152 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Liam Croker from Electrofunk Soul Sonic Collective, Wenatchee, to talk about their debut album, Sympathy for the Future, alongside the album's producer, the legendary John X. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to British singer-songwriter and musician Andrew Rochford. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating, and leave a comment. Electrofunk Soul Sonic Collective, Wenatchee, have released their debut album, Sympathy for the Future. It's an album I've been waiting on for a long time, and I wasn't disappointed. It's fantastic. In this interview, Liam Crooker and the album's producer, John X, talk about writing and recording the album in Los Angeles and lots more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Liam Crooker and John X from Wenatchee. Hi Liam, hi John, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Thanks for having us mate. Hey guys. Great to have you both. You've just released your album, Sympathy for the Future. It's excellent. Um, Access Noise have been covering you guys from the beginning. And the first time I interviewed you, I think it was 2016. Liam, um, we talked about an album, and now it's finally here. So how does it feel for both of you that it, that's finally out in the world? It For me, it was like a huge weight off our shoulders. I think, you know, that album was made a couple of times. I mean, the album I spoke to you about in 2016, um, you know, songs from that were released. So you had The Room of the Zoo, you had Transition, um, Sense of Danger, things like that. So the album was kind of made twice in, you know, the songs came out from the original one and then we ended up 2018 in America and we went in with John, and we kept throughout 2018 and 19. We were back and to the states a lot. Um, our management at that point was in it was in America, so we were, we were just back. You know, we were there quite a lot, and it was sort of done in. It, it wasn't like hey, we're going to sit down and make a record. Really, it was it was sort of we'd go in with John and we'd do a couple of tracks here, we'd do a track there, and then in 2019, me in the and Anthony went over to LA and. Spent a couple, I can't remember, about two or three weeks um, with John in the studio. And we got a, the sort of, the, you know, the, the main chunk of the album done with him over there. Yeah, that's 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 what happened. So we had a lot of the, the sort of pre-production done over in the UK. And then we went over with John and sort of, did a dem- you know, we demoed stuff back in our own studio here. And then we took over to John and um, put it together, basically. It's beautiful, man. It was a beautiful experience. And the band started out as China White. Then mm. you were the Wenatchee tribe. You've completely dropped the tribe, and you're now Wenatchee. So why did you drop the tribe? <laughs> the tribe because we were back in two to the state, and uh, our then manager Howie B. Um, he just brought up the whole thing of you know the, the the tribe thing not being very PC, so to speak, and it was his idea to drop it. I. You know, was I into the idea? Not really, but I went with it. And you know, to, to be honest, mate, most people just call us Wenatchee anyway. We were just known as Wenatchee. So, yeah, it's, it's easy to say, you know, especially for Anthony. He struggles to speak anyway. So, like, Wenatchee is easy to say than the Wenatchee tribe. And, and also, you know, the album was made during lockdown and we changed management and et cetera, et cetera. So we came out as the same band, but just a fresh new version of it. I suppose, yeah. And who's in the current lineup? Because a few members have left, haven't they? A couple of members left, yeah. Um, so it's me, Anthony Edgerton in the Goldfinger, Richard Ritchie, and the two new members, uh, um, Andrew McKay on the guitar, on guitar, and Paul Lawrence on drums. And John, when did you become aware of the of Wenatchee, and how did you get involved as producer on the album? Well, I I go all the way back with them. The very first thing that I did with um these guys was when they were china white and if i'm not mistaken it was a remix of a black sabbath 
cover that they had done, which is a gorgeous track. And I keep telling them they got to re-release it because it's just beautiful. Um, I think it was, is it, it's all right. It was that the title. It's all right. And it had a very interesting yeah. cast junk because it had Keith Allen on it. Um, it had Harry the dog on it. It had Eliza. Eliza, was Eliza, there. and then we had Eve Eva Gardner uh, from bass. Pink Band yeah. playing bass. It's got this beautiful all star cast. Yeah, great track. And that was quite a few years ago. I don't really remember specifically when it was, but that was the beginning of what would be a fun and very creative relationship with these lads. It must have been ten years ago, easy. Yeah, so, I think I, that sounds about right. Yeah, 10 years ago, that definitely. Yeah. So, you know, to fast forward up to this album, you know, Liam pretty much described the trajectory of it already. Um, now, when I'm, whenever I'm working with this particular crew, I don't feel like, you know, with some of the stuff that I produce, I'm going to do it from the ground up. I'm going to play everything um, or have a lot of say in every piece that goes down. But with this crew, I mean, Anthony really covers a lot of the production and his his general production instinct and intuition is pretty fantastic. So sometimes I really come in, I might change some stuff. Sometimes I might not, but I'm really going to be focusing on maybe the big picture. What kind of frosting can I throw on Liam's head to make him more tasty for the masses uh maybe do we want to put some harmonies i think there was one particular song on this one that i actually dismantled and rearranged um funky heaven in hell heaven in hell Fun- like- and then there was funky but cheap yeah, which yes. was more of a ground up piece yeah but you know i trust and i love Anthony's production so I don't always feel like, you know, some producers are going to come in and just change everything because they have to, but I never really approach it that way. I, I love his playing. I love his guitar playing. I don't always know whether it's him or Andy or Mike. I have no idea because he doesn't label the tracks that clearly. So it just says funk guitar and I have to guess who's playing. Um but I know that I'm going to be able to keep that stuff. And I don't think there's there's never been a time where I, you know, reached out to Andy and said, hey, you know what? I don't think that part kind of rocks like it sucks. That has never happened. And I'm sure it's never going to. So I always feel like these are true um, co-productions. You know, I don't I do not feel like the exclusive um, master of the big picture of these. But I do like to make sure that the big picture is complete before it's released into the world. And like Liam said, you know, we've watched this particular project simmer on the burner for a long time. So it feels so good to hear it out in the world. Um, I think I sent the boys a text a couple of days ago saying, I finally got to listen to the whole album while driving down the highway at about 90 miles an hour. And I don't know why somehow like speeding and listening to the music, they seem to really go hand in hand. And it just, it was such a party. And, you know, it made that 45 minute drive go very quickly. Did you find, John, because I hadn't listened to the album in a long time. When it did, when it was released, I actually put it on and I listened to it, you know, from start to finish. Did you find it quite emotional that it almost took you back to like like a time capsule? It took you back to when we were doing it. You know, it did. But then, you know, I also heard like a few new little things that totally. hadn't been there before and i'm like yeah nice work lads and it just it felt like a really cohesive event you know from start to finish yeah, yeah. one the one that i was probably the least familiar with was the last song on the mm-hmm. album and i just love that one it's yeah I, yeah. I I fell in love with it i remembered <laughs> that we had done a little work on it but it was probably the one that i had the least interaction with because it was kind of done when it got here. Liam, when I see music often carries messages of unity and positivity, mm. can you share some of the themes and inspirations behind the lyrics in the album? 
in this record in particular, yeah, I mean, it's a um, diverse sort of bunch of lyrics, really. You know, Heaven in L.A. was the last song that I li- wrote lyrically for the record, which was my kind of love letter to that city. It's, you know, it's, I think it's a city that, I mean, you know, John's lived there for a long time, but, you know, as an Englishman going in and out of it, it can either... You either love it or hate it. You know, we happen to love the place. Um, we've got up to, you know, some naughty shit while we're in that city. But I have in particular, yeah, you know, we've done quite a lot of drugs and <laughs> um, partied quite hard and met some amazing people and some absolute fucking dickheads, to be fair. But do you know what? The um, the, the the song Heaven in LA, for instance, is my love letter to Los Angeles. The majority of the album, though, barring that, is a kind of, it's a little bit of darkness and light. It's painting a picture of the world that we're living in at the moment and giving, you know, telling people to hang on and just, you know, keep the chin up and everything's going to be all right kind of thing, you know? That's it. Yeah, well, Heaven and Hell A was the first single from the album. And, and we, Access Noise, we premiered the Heaven and Hell A uh, remix EP in December, which we were very, very pleased to do. What's the meaning behind the title, Sympathy for the Future? <laughs> well, do you know what, mate? I could, I could tell you. Or I could just leave it for you to, to think about because the reality between you know, of Sympathy for the Future is it's not that romantic, really. I mean, the, the, you see the album cover with the babies and the gas masks and all that kind of thing. The artist, um, Grimmy, from Salford, Manchester, you know, he took his take on it and he turned it into something else which I think is great and people people are doing that they're taking sympathy for the future and they're thinking there's a message in it which is brilliant the reality is when we were demoing the track me and I, it was him with an acoustic guitar and me singing the lyrics it sounded like sympathy for the devil and uh, <laughs> obviously we couldn't call it that and we thought well the track's going to come out in the future so yeah sympathy for the future there you go <laughs> <laughs> well the first track on the album which I love is The Arrival it yep. reminds me of the intro from the beginning of the second Stone Roses album, Second Common. Was that an inspiration? No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. I, I know what you mean. I mean, I've I've heard it myself and thought, yeah, it does sound like that, doesn't it? It has that sort of uh, vibe to it. It wasn't. Uh, we had a piece of music over from the Room of the Zoo sessions, a, a, a rough, very rough sort of percussion-led um, piece of music and we went in with John and it was just the thing I love about John is he's, he's as crazy as the band you know so it, I remember like two o'clock in the morning saying to John more elephant give me more elephant he's like hey man <laughs> I'm pushing the elephant as hard as I can like, and um, you know it, it was we just wanted to make this sort of tribal it was a nod to the tribe I suppose tribal-esque um, funk driven. I can't, for us, it was more not Stone Roses, more funkadelic. It was more something off Maggot Brain. Um, you know, Anthony did, I think Anthony did some amazing sort of feedback guitar on it. And, you know, what if I said to John, throw a, an orangutan in there, he threw an orangutan in it. And, you know, we've always had a thing with animals, haven't we, John? You know, there's always. <laughs> yeah, we do. I mean, fortunately, <laughs> I had some of those animals in my bedroom already. Yeah, he just, he's, got, he's probably got a few of them with him right now. But um, it was, yeah, it was a real sort of, just a laugh, it was a laugh, it was creative, and it was just throwing everything at it. I remember John actually played a harmonica on that track. Throughout that oh, song. gosh, I forgot all about that. Yeah, yeah, so John's playing <laughs> harmonica on that song, and he really fucked it up, and it doesn't sound like a harmonica, but is, John is playing harmonica on that song. And we, we just wanted a crazy... So I said I, that's what I said to John. I said I want it to sound like a biblical zoo, and that anyway. Okay, I got. He just said, "Okay, I got you," and that's what we did. As many orangutans and elephants as we could get, and we got them all in the studio. Yeah. And to be fair, I, we, I was quite high when we did it, and you know, I think the rest of the guys were a little bit maybe. So, yeah. So, John, yeah. can you describe your typical studio setup and the atmosphere? The atmosphere you like to create when you're working with bands or artists. I mean, it's, I wouldn't describe this as a big place. You know, the control room's pretty small. Everything's in the box. There's no console. But what I did was set up 
a buffet of my favorite mic preamps and limiters and processing gear. So I can track everything beautifully and cleanly, beautifully. I can get whatever sound I want. Um, we also have a huge collection of toys, stomp boxes, guitar amps. There's a few items in this place that I built myself. I made my own guitar amp. I've made some microphones. I've made mic preamps. And I get into a little bit of that nerdy stuff, that DIY nerd stuff, which I really enjoy. And it's really satisfying to say, I just recorded this through a microphone that I built or a compressor that I built. So I really do enjoy that. But, you know, when it comes to recording humans, if I can get them into a space where they forget that I'm there and they start completely ignoring me, that to me is the ideal place. You know, I don't necessarily need the artist to look at me at the end of a take and say, how is that? Um, I'd actually rather have them look at me at the end of the take and say, you better have recorded that motherfucker. Uh -huh. And that would be the indication that something really beautiful just came out of them and they know it, they feel it and they're aware of it. And I definitely was not always like that. When I was younger, I was really got into like a few years of being a control freak. And I found that the results were not nearly as good as when you find that place to allow people to shine. Um, and you look at what their skill set is and you look at what they're good at and try to get that into what they're putting down on. I, I'm still, I was still about to say tape because I'm friggin' old, but it, to get them to record that thing, that moment, that mood, when they're excited, all of that stuff, even in the digital world, I still think that whatever's going on in the person's head and heart during their performance, somehow that stuff is still being recorded. So the more of that excitement and life that you can capture, I think the better. And that's really the sort of approach that I've been taking probably for the last five, 10 years. And then the other thing is that you really want your artist, your band, everybody, you want them to walk away stoked so that when they're playing that project for someone, they're playing this thing for the first time for someone, the first thing they're going to say is, I can't wait for you to hear this thing we just did. It's so bad. Uh, I've played it like 500 million times in my house. And my wife's going to kill me. Like that's the response that you want to send your artist out with. Um, anything else um, is going to destroy it before it even hits the airwaves. You know, if Liam's like, yeah, you know, we spent three years on this thing and, you know, it's finally done and I wish it could, you know, it could have been better. That is like absolutely the opposite. I would ever want anybody to say about something that I just spent a bunch of time working on. So that is like a crucial, crucial point. Probably those two things that I just described are my main targets. What was the most difficult track on the album to get right? Probably looking at it now, maybe Smolder. Smolder was quite tough to get. Um, I mean, vocally it was okay, but I think with John, he wanted a real live because um, a lot of our stuff's programmed. Um, but John wanted a real, he wanted a band sound for that. If you remember, John, and we had Sam playing drums, Mike on guitar, Rich playing bass, in the on percussion, Natalie and myself singing, um, Anthony, you know, playing keys and stuff. So that was that was. It, it, none of it. I mean, none of it was hard as such. It was just a bigger um, process to get it right. I remember, you know, Sam trying to get the drum sound right was a bit tricky and stuff. But in general, like John said, the studio, where, you know, Earthstar uh, Creation Center where John is, doesn't feel like a studio. I've worked in many studios over the years. I've worked with different producers and engineers and stuff, and. Working with John's, John's a pleasure. You know, you, you, you're very at ease when you go in there. You're not, you know, you, you don't feel intimidated. John 
you know, it's not like a love letter, this, but it, it just makes you feel good. You know, you, feel, you enjoy the process and you have a laugh. You, you do come away feeling stoked. You feel, you know, inspired by being there. I love the place. You know, it's great. It's, it's a really beautiful place to work. It's a nice vibe. And John, but when we were making the record, you know, John was almost the, the seventh member of the band. He was, you know, he's part of our family and we worked really hard in a, in a very nice setting, should I say. Yeah. You know what I would say is the most difficult thing? Um, it's understanding what these guys are saying to me after they've had a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most people find that, John. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I mean, honestly, I don't have any um, difficult memories of anything in this group going all the way back to the beginning. I really don't. I don't have any sort of like, oh, God, I'm glad that day was over yeah. memories. And believe me, I got a ton of those, but I don't have any with this particular bunch of people. I can't believe I'm still, I'm, we're sitting here actually talking about it when that's the album, because again, you know, Liam, I've messaged you over the years, and it, when's the album coming out? So it's great that we're sitting talking about it. My favourite song on the album is the second single, For You, Ed Kill, which was also released to coincide with the release of the Wanati, the Wanati Collection Trainers, uh, designed exclusively by iconic Italian fashion brand. Like, tell me if I'm doing, saying this right, Pantofola Dero. They look really cool. So how, how did that collaboration come around? Um, it came through a mutual friend of ours. Uh, John's met him, Ben. You know Ben? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Ben was working for Pantofel Dioro. He was there, I can't remember, I might be wrong here, but I think he was their sort of sales rep in the UK. And um, they did a launch in London for the 1990 collection, it was called. And we got an invite to basically they shut down Carnaby Street in London. And they had like Duff McKagan there for Guns N' Roses, Matt Collins and the Charlottes, the Paolo De Canio. It was a really crazy thing. And we performed in the street outside their their store. Um, that luckily for us, that the the owner of the company was there, and he saw the band, and he just yeah, he sort of fell in love with us. It's hard not to fall in love with us, Matt. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, we, we have that effect on people. So I don't know why, but we do. And um, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, he, he just he started endorsing the band. And, you know, he sort of flew us to Italy. He, he funded videos and endorsed the band through clothes and stuff. And then, yeah, we we designed some trainers with him in 2019, which didn't come out because of lockdown. And then we put we designed another pair, which came out this year. So that that relationship with Kim is still very much ongoing, and that brand has been a, a huge because you know. We're actually still, you know, we're still an unsigned band as such. and But we do have endorsement and things like that, which really help with certain things. And Kim and Pantoffel have been a massive part of that. Huge. So if anyone listening wants a pair, how do they get them? Go on the website and uh, buy them. <laughs> Go to the, the Pantoffel website and buy them. We've not even got a pair. So, so yeah, <laughs> get on the website and buy some, man. Yeah. So collaboration is a key element of Wanati's music. This album features Natalie Wilde and the one and only Rowetta from Happy Mondays. Yeah. So how did they get involved? Natalie, uh, I think we met Natalie. Through, was, was, uh, do you know what? It's all a bit confusing. So there was John, Danny Sabre and Harry. I don't know who introduced us to Natalie first. I think it might have been. It was either John or Harry. Was it you, was it you John? It might have been because she's usually my number one choice, you know, when I'm looking yeah. for an incredibly versatile singer. I mean, she can just she can take it down, but she can crank up her power whenever she needs mm. it. So she's I've always felt like she is a really perfect studio rat. I think I think. It, yeah. So I think, John, I think we were talking about getting female backing on the tracks. Um but we had met Natalie actually during the Room of the Zoo video with Tommy Flanagan. We met her, so we met her through Harry initially, but not in a musical sense. We were just sort of out drinking with her and stuff, having a like, partying kind of thing. And um, I think it was John who introduced us in the studio, and she came in. One thing I love about Natalie, she doesn't take any shit at all. 
you know, she's she's a really <laughs> John's there trying not to smile. <laughs> <laughs> she's a she's a really cool girl. I mean, she's a really nice uh, person. You know, she really is. Just, but she doesn't suffer fools lightly, and she, you know, and that's what I like about her. She comes in, no no bullshit, and she just does the job, and and she knows what she's doing. And her voice and my voice, I think, work together really well. Definitely, yeah. you know, and we enjoy working with her. We've known her for a number of years. And she just nailed it. I remember once I, I was sort of where John is in the control room. Behind John, there's like a kitchen sort of, yeah, kitchen. Yeah, the lounge. Yeah, That's where lounge. I'm sitting right now. And I was, I had one of these burgers. When I say burgers, it's not a, a sort of cold word for drugs. It was just a burger. So so next to where John, the studio is, there's like a, a burger joint. How do you explain the burger place, John? It's just a little, it's like one window with a kitchen right behind it. It's a very small operation. And they just sell like burger, a chicken sandwich, and some other vegetarian thing, and French fries. And that's it. That's all they make. And it's amazing. The amazing. Smell, they're, they're about half a block away, so the smell from their kitchen just pours through the control room window all day long. And just tempt anybody who's sitting in the control room. But once you have one of them, especially if you're jet lagged and a little drunk, you tend to fall asleep. So I had a burger and fallen asleep uh, on the couch in the um, the kitchen area, and I woke up and it was like a dream because Natalie had come in, and my favorite track off the album is a song called Toe Dipping. And I was about to, I was actually about to get on to that because that's one of my favorites as well. But go ahead. Yeah. So so I. She, I think I remember Natalie turning up to do the vocals for it, but I'd then fallen asleep. So I missed the vocal session. I woke up at the end of it and it was that beautiful what I could hear. I thought I was like, it was like being waking up in heaven. I, I woke up and I was like, fuck me. I, I didn't even know where I was. All I could hear was Natalie's vocals on this song. And I remember that to this day. It was so trippy and weird and unnerving in the most beautiful way because I had no, I was. I had no idea where I was. I just remember hearing Natalie's voice, and it was yeah, it was like angelic. It was an amazing experience. That so, John, it all sounds a bit, a bit mad in the studio, trying to keep everyone awake. Can, <laughs> can you remember uh, any memorable stories uh, you, from recording the album that, you, that springs to mind? Well, you know, I have maybe some nerdy memories. Um, <laughs> like there was a nerdy memory when Mike B was there playing guitar. And I think we tried like six different wah-wahs out. And then I was like, you know, I've got this really shit wah-wah that like nobody ever uses. And everyone just fucking hates this wah-wah. And I pulled it out. And of course, Mike just loved it immediately. And, you know, I don't remember which song that was on, but it's it's a nasty little pedal like it's just horrible it's it's like um you're strangling a duck or something it's <laughs> <laughs> but i don't know somehow it was really perfect for that song there was another one where um where richie was going to do a bass line on something and he did his first take and he was like kind of figuring out so he was playing it very minimal and of course i just love the minimal but then once he figured it out he started, you know, getting super fancy. And I was like, all right, dude, I'm going to literally duct tape your fingers together be to make you stop that just to get him to like revert back to that sort of minimalist space because yeah. he had such a quintessentially sick groove when he was kind of just figuring it out. And we got there. Um, yeah. But <clears throat> once... Once you have to activate that like conscious restraint on someone, you know, it kind of takes them a couple of spins before they can rework their brain to stop doing that. But he totally went there because he is a sick and amazingly talented bass player. I remember the last session we did with John Mark um, on the album because because uh, the album so so the album was sort of mixed to finish during lockdown. But the last session we did with John in L.A we was in a celebratory mood and we got the tequila out and we got a wizard's cape. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I was really sunburned. I've been down to Venice beach. I got really sunburned. I came back and drank uh, sort of with John and Anthony sort of a bottle of tequila between us pretty much. And then we went out for a Mexican meal that night and we did a photo shoot in the studio, me, you and, and, and that is, the funny thing is the photo shoot we're on our knees 
<laughs> we're pretty much on our knees, not out of choice. It's just because we couldn't fucking stand up. But it's so, yeah. yeah, I remember that was quite fun. That was a fun time. I feel like there was one sort of lost afternoon when, um, I don't remember the people's names, but this married couple showed up. Yeah. And it turned into a party and it became very clear early on that we were not going to get any work done at all, but it was really fun. It was like, Oh, this, this takes me back. (laughs) And, and although it's rare for me, I know I jumped in with you guys on the party. You jumped in. You you just, you know what? You just let it go, John. You just jumped in the deep end and we had it. But you know what? We we deserved that day. We had a fun session, didn't we? We had a good time. And the album's title track, Features the legendary Rowetta, uh-huh. uh huh, from Happy Monday. So, h- how does she get involved in the track? She, I think she's done stuff with you before, hasn't she? I've known Rowetta for God, twenty years, easy. Must be nearly about nearly twenty years. She's um, written with you know she's done sessions with us before, and the, yeah, it, it was just a case of asking her to come down the studio, and she she took my lyrics and then put her own. She changed you know changed the melody to it, and Rowetta's. You know, super cool to work with. You know, she's the force of nature. Um, she intimidates some people. I think you know. You, you, she, she, again, she's like Natalie in a sense where there's no shit. She won't take any shit. She, she, I think you know, being a woman in this industry, you have to sort of have that that way, you know, that sort of way about you. You know, and Rowetta's definitely got that. Man, you know, imagine being in the Happy Monday. <laughs> well, that's what it's about to say. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah she, she came to our studio in Warrington and she recorded the session and she's performed Sympathy for the Future with us many times live. Um, that's the oldest song on the record, actually. That was the first song that was done a long time ago. And she just, yeah, she just came in and nailed it, man. And yeah, she looked, she's really happy with the end product. She, she heard it recently for the first time. You know, finished, and you know, I was thinking, oh, what's she going to say? You know, because well, I will tell you what she thinks. If she don't like it. She'll say, no, I don't, I don't like that. I don't want that going out with my name on it. And she was blown away. Yeah, she she loved it, which was great. So, cool. Yeah, it's a fantastic track. Thank you. Yeah, it's an epic song. It's great to play live as well. We normally finish our sets with it live. It's like our, our paradise city, so to speak. And also in the in the past few years, you re- received awards, uh, ISA or ISSA awards, or what's what's that for best international band? It's for the um, international singer song international singer songwriters association. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a you know like it is what it, what it says, and um, it's a global thing. And yeah, we were voted as the best international band for our songwriting. It was, and uh, also. For the best video for Funky But Chic, which obviously John was involved with the making of the song, and uh, Kim Williams, who is the owner of Pantofla de Oro, he funded that video and also makes a cameo in the video. He's chasing us as one of the police policemen in the video. But yeah, we won um, won the awards for that, and we've flown over to Atlanta and got our awards, did the red carpet thing performed headline the event it was very surreal yeah but also you know we felt like, yo we deserved it you know really good band and, and the current state of the music industry that the way it is now what challenges have you faced and how have you overcome them as a band and also for you john as a producer do you want to go first john no you go first ladies first all right <laughs> thank you johnny um <laughs> so i mean when that she's always where we've always been a bit of our own Entity, we, 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 I don't know to really how, how to answer that. It's, it's changed in a sense with the social media, the whole instant, you know, the social media things become such a huge part of it in Spotify and YouTube and all that kind of thing. Um, we still very much are in this for music and the, the art form of, you know, wanting to make records in our, our sort of artistic gratification. It's very much, uh, for me, this is my personal opinion. Spotify has ruined a lot of stuff for bands. I think it's really and become a numbers game. I suppose it always was in selling records and stuff. But in, with Spotify, you're not selling records. You know, you could have hundred thousand streams on a song, and the, the artist might make fifty p or whatever. It's crazy, but you have to do it to be seen to be an artist at a certain level. I think that's um, definitely ruined certain parts of why people younger bands get into being you know in the industry but you know i don't know how john feels about that but 
I think the social media thing and the and the Spotify thing hasn't been a great from, from an artist's point of view hasn't been a great um, thing. Hasn't been a, yeah hasn't had a, a great influence on the industry. I don't I don't think um, I might be wrong. You know, John might disagree with me. I don't think it has personally. But you know, it's given people a, an easier way to get exposure and people can find you you know quickly. We're, you know, we're an old school band in the sense that an album, and I'm sure John and yourself, Matt, you know, an album is a book, it's a piece of art, it's, you know, something you want to listen from the start to finish as a piece, where now I think kids, they just, you want that quick gratification of one song, oh yeah, yeah, well I'll listen to, you know, it's, does, do albums even matter anymore? I don't know. To me they do. To, to a 20 year old kid, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, so in that way, it has changed, yeah. John? Yeah, no, I could chime right in. I knew, I remember like in the early 90s when we first started getting the ability to upload your own music and, you know, independently release to distributors. It seemed like, wow, for the first time, you know, the artist is going to be able to maybe control their destiny and bring in you know, a little bit more than what they've been getting from record labels from all these years, which for the most part was kind of nothing. Um, and it took almost no time before the same thing happened within that. Now it's not even a record company. It's not even people who have to do with music, you know, Spotify and Apple Music, those executives, I'll bet those guys don't even listen to music. I mean, they're just generally seem like they've got to be fairly questionable humans to have allowed that entity to have become exactly what it is. So I absolutely agree with Liam on that point. There's another thing that I've also noticed, and this is in the last few years, I've started to collaborate with people. It, it started after the lockdown. I started collaborating with people all over the world um, on songwriting and production projects. And what I started seeing there was there might be one person who creates the beat or the instrumental track, the second person who does their own vocal production. And sometimes there might even be a third person who's mixing it. And it's almost as if um, I've watched you know, I was talking about the producer overseeing the big picture, and I feel like I'm watching the vanishing of that role, and it's being sort of split off into a piecemeal, like, you know, we're creating the straps for the hat in one country, and then somebody takes it and assembles it and puts it out, and that's literally the last person who has their hands on it. And I guess the only person who has any control over the big picture might be the artist, which it can be great, but um, often the artist may not be as in tune with the details as much as the more objective production type. So I have noticed this change. And I think also with that, comes hand in hand with songs where you see maybe five to eight songwriters have participated on the same song. So everyone's like, here, here's this thing that I did and threw it in. And it's the songs become sort of these collection of piecemeal suggestions that all kind of fit together, but maybe lack the cohesive vision that older albums may have used to have, used to have had and i could be completely off base with this and this could just be my perception because of this sort of insular songwriting world that i have recently jumped into but it seems very commonplace there and almost like standard operating procedure these days for the listeners i can see behind you john you have a lot of gold discs on the wall can you tell me what some of those are uh, some are old, some are new. Um, there's a couple of albums um, that we had done here with Pink. Um, she's done it like four or five albums here at the studio, and I have worked on some of them. I even mixed one song for them. 
some of them are there's something from ti um that was also fairly recent kenny chesney was also recent but then there's ice cube bonnie Raitt, tracy chapman rolling stones wow crazy town a band called Len from like the 90s. It's a really diverse, it's a very strange and diverse <laughs> collection of albums. I definitely have never been someone to stay in the same genre. I have bounced around forever. So there's a lot of variation <laughs> if you're looking at them. <laughs> what music producers have inspired you over the years? You know who I have always sort of gravitated towards is um, Daniel Lanois. Um, and I do like a lot of his, um, like him and T-Bone Burnett. I feel like they both sort of step outside of the, you know, they always are going to sort of step outside of that bubblegum mainstream genre and come in with some really natural stuff. Um, there are a few things that I've liked from Rick Rubin, but I don't think there's anything about his approach. I don't know that I do anything similar to him whatsoever, but there are certainly some albums that he has done that I absolutely love. And of course, there's some really old school people, you know, 70s people, you know, I am always going to be a Beatles fan. So there's George Martin, you know, I'm, gonna always love him roy thomas who did a bunch of queen songs uh he's another you know if i'm looking back into my retro classics those two i really you know have a affinity towards as well i'd like to ask my guests the following questions if you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career what would it be for me it would be um when we made the the video for A Room of the Zoo with Tommy Flanagan on that horse. Good video. Yeah, I was, I remember being really hungover and shitting myself on the back of the horse. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was a great, it was a magical, magical experience and something that I'll never forget. And yeah, just, I'd like to, if I could go back and do that again, just for the, surre how surreal it was. Um, yeah. You know, it, it came together within uh, literally a few days. We got a phone call, and then two days we was in LA, and I was on the back of Tommy's horse and got around his his um his ranch in Malibu. Well, he was really stoned, and I was really hungover, and it was just a yeah, yeah, it was it was something else. If I could do that again, I'd do it in a happy. What about you, John? You know, I, I I have had so many incredible moments. I feel like as if the last. God, 40, whatever, 43 years since I started doing this, I feel like it's just been a nonstop series of insane moments. Um, so if I could do anything over, I would probably have been writing it all down every night after it happened because those memories are starting to get blurrier and blurrier with each passing day. And that might be probably what I would go back and do if I could, you know, change anything in time would be like, okay, dude, 43 years from now, you're not going to remember this even happened. So write it down. <laughs> For us music fans, music is the soundtrack to our memories. What song or album, when you listen to it, brings back the best memories for you? I'll let Liam go first for yeah. that one. Yeah, that's a tough one, that. But there's a number of them. Probably... If I had to, I mean, if, it, if I had to choose one, and there's many, there's so many, Matt. One standout one, which changed a lot for me, um, was there's a riot going on by Sly and the Family Stone. Um, when I heard that, I understood funk music. You know, that that was, it went from like, you know, listen to James Brown and your typical sort of funk. That was a dark paranoid weird it, it showed me another side to funk music so there's a riot going on and maggot brain by funkadelic yeah those two albums really take me back to maybe 20 years ago when I, when me and anthony started to write together um we were listening to maggot brain and there's a riot going on on repeat so there those two albums massive influences on me 
John? Well, okay. So gosh, again, there's a lot. And I really understand the nature of that memory trigger. And there are a number of them. Like, for example, when I was in high school, I was still listening to lots of prog rock. So the minute I hear like a Yes album, I am immediately transported to 1978, 1979. And I remember just being a crazy little teenage stoner getting in trouble every night. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think the, the most pivotal, there was a really pivotal point when I first started college and I was working as a radio station DJ. And at the time I didn't really have a lot of musical experience under my belt. I knew pop radio and I knew the stuff that my older sisters listened to. But um, when I got this gig as a DJ at a radio station, all of a sudden I had this huge room full of vinyl that went back to the 19, some of it went back to like the 1930s and 40s. They had an amazing collection of music there. And I remember walking in one day and picking up a copy of, like we were still getting albums, vinyl mailed in from record companies at the time. And this was 1979 and um, maybe early 80. And I walked in and Bob Marley's Kaya was yeah. the first package that I opened and I had never heard reggae music before. So of course I put it on without even, all I saw was that giant spliff on the cover. I was like, Oh, I've got to play this on my show. <laughs> and, you know, I started with one song and I think i just let the whole album play and flipped it over. And then it was um, in this strange serendipitous event not long after that, and of course, that album had gone into heavy rotation in my world almost immediately. But then not long after that, lo and behold, he comes to Pittsburgh to play this show at this gorgeous theater called the Stanley Theater there. So I went to the theater. I'd never seen a reggae show. Up till then, every band I had seen, there might have been four or five people on stage. And... I walked in, I think there might have been like 20 people on that stage. It was like brass. There was two percussionists, five background vocalists, two guitar players. It was just like this insane circus of people that were just throwing down the most amazing grooves. And it was, that was a very transformative experience. I think up until then, the only bands that I'd seen perform live were all rock bands. Um, so that was, that was, you know, a full ultimate groove experience. And I think that may have really opened me up. Not only, um, I wouldn't, I definitely couldn't call myself any kind of a serious reggae expert because I never delved that far into it, but that definitely expanded me into my R and B world almost immediately. It was a direct and immediate transition so I might have to call that like a very pivotal point. What song or album is your guilty pleasure? Mm. Guilty, guilty pleasure. I mean, I don't think I've got. A, um, I don't think I've got a guilty pleasure. To be fair, Mark, I don't know. I don't know. When well, you say guilty, um, I always say if you're in a car and you're driving down the road, if you have this song on, would you have the windows up or windows down? I'm a huge Guns N' Roses fan. So, so the guilty pleasure. Yeah, I mean, are they guilty pleasures for some people? They might be. I don't know. I mean, you know, November rain. They put November rain on. Some people think it's cheesy, you know, cock rock stadium, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, November rain to me would be, I suppose, a guilty pleasure. But it's not really, is it? I mean, it's comfortable. no, so, no. So I don't know, mate. I don't think I've got a guilty pleasure. No, I don't think I have. I mean, at the moment, I'm completely obsessed with Jane's addiction. So. I'm listening to nothing shocking on repeat, um, just for the sack, just for the yeah, just for the case that I'm listening to it on repeat and I have done for the twelve months. Jane's addiction, I'm a guilty pleasure at the moment because it's driving my wife up the wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, John? Any guilty pleasure? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a guilty pleasure because I can't ever 
think the only the last time I can think of feeling guilty about the music that I was listening to again was probably back in high school when all of my friends were listening to like rock, you know, everybody was like rock or prog rock or whatever was on FM radio in, in the late seventies. But that was the only time I had a guilty pleasure was, I, and everybody was wearing disco socks pins and I would totally sneak in. I would be in my room dancing to like Saturday night fever secretly. And that's probably the last time I remember having a guilty pleasure about music because now there's there's really nothing guilty if i just want to hear something i'm going to put it on and uh, you know what? Uh, what? an emotion like guilt will never come into play jo john i would pay good money to watch you dance into saturday night fever <laughs> secretly <laughs> by yourself in the room honestly I'd pay, i would i would pay to watch that <laughs> So that's me done, guys. Is there anything you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Any live shows coming up or anything, Liam? We're doing a video, actually, for the next album. So, yeah, we're doing a video for a track off the next record in France next week. We am going to be doing a short set at the venue, The Black Sheep, the 14th of September. We headline um, After All Festival um, in Manchester on the 21st of October. And then there are other dates lined up which haven't been announced yet. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff happening. And, you know, the record's going to be coming out on vinyl in a couple of weeks as well. So if you're listening, go and buy the fucking record, man. Don't stream it. Go and buy it. Feed, feed these starving musicians, you know what I mean? And where can listeners get it? At the moment, on like, yeah, digitally, you know, iTunes, uh, Spotify, all the, all the usual places. And like I said, we're going to be putting it out. Uh, we're going to put a deluxe version out through Bandcamp with all the remixes in the next couple of weeks. And also the vinyl pre-order will be dropping then as well. Cool. And you mentioned the second album. You're making a video for a track in the second album. Where yeah. can we hear that? And what sort of... The second album coming out next year. It'll be out by next summer. Because there's, there's, there's songs from the, the album we did with John that are still left out, like Acclimatise. Um, we did a version of a transition with John. So a, a lot of the, the next record is pretty much in the bag. It's just been shaping up a little bit, mixing them. I mean, it, I mean, honestly, it's it's kind of done, really. Um, so we're going over to France to do a song called, the video for a song called Planet Funk <laughs> um, with a French producer called Eclosion. And yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it so that's the, probably going to be the first single off the next record. Um, I've done a great collaboration with Howie B. For his album that's coming out, it'd be it's got Eddie Vedder on it from Pearl Jam, uh, wow. the Edge, the Edge from U2 is playing on it, um, and myself, yeah. So I'm I'm singing on one of Howie's records. I think it's like a 12 minute track that I sang on. Um, so I'm looking forward to that coming out as well at some point. But well, obviously that's down to Howie. But yeah, great song called. I, I won't say actually. I won't. I won't tell, I'll leave that to Howie. But uh, yeah, there's a really exciting collaboration with Howie B. So. Yeah, just watch this space. There's a lot of stuff happening. It's exciting. Yeah, it's good. I'd, I'd like to get Howie on the podcast. Then when that comes out, that would be a good one. Yeah, that would be good. And also get me and Howie on together. Pissed. Get us both, you know, drink a bottle of whiskey each. And try to understand <laughs> me, me, Howie and you. Try to understand each other would be fucking brilliant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a Scottish man and an yeah. English man. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> what about you, John? What project have you got coming up? Well, right now I'm just wrapping up, um, writing a couple of songs for a very dark post-apocalyptic video game. Um, and it started as a sort of small project, but then I recruited some really fun people to jump in on it. So I brought Dave Aberziz, the drummer from Pearl Jam, and I got Scott Reeder from Caius. Then I even got... Um, Royston Langdon from Space Hog to do the lead vocals. So what started out as this very small, like dumb project that was just going to be used for promotional material has now sort of snowballed into this very cool sort of um, star filled uh, event that uh, the video game people just reached out and they said, you know what? We love the way these tracks came out so much that we're going to actually put them in the game and give the user the ability to remix them and do all that kind of fun stuff. So that's been really fun. You know, I always love the writing 
process as well. It's, it's something I definitely gravitate towards. And with the Wenatchee's, it's not something I really have to do because Liam's got that covered. But when someone brings me in to write, you know, straight from the top, that's always a really fun, challenging experience. And because of the subject matter, it's sort of creepy and dark. It's It was just something that I could immediately have a lot of fun with. Um, that's mm-hmm. just one. There's probably like five other projects brewing but that's the most fun it's the most recent and usually i only remember what's going on in the last like 48 hours <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, one, one thing mark that we did that we've not really spoke about was uh last year which kind of was, was a really nice way to sort of finish off the whole project with john on this record we went we flew out to la and we did the video for heaven in la <laughs> where John, <laughs> where John um, co-stars in it, I would say, and he, he plays a very sinister kind of shamanic uh, drug dealing. I don't devil, I suppose. Really, is that right, John? Pick- that was my perception that I was kind of a devilish figure. Yeah. And uh, that was great fun. I'd fallen down a mountain the night before, so I was really beat, battered, and bruised. <laughs> Cruise, and then um, we did the video with John and Frankie Clark. Yeah, Frankie was in it. Um, yeah, that was fun, wasn't it? We had a good, we had a good laugh doing that. It really was, and the video came out great. It's really yeah. fun. It's just goofy. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was. It was meant to be, you know. So yeah, that was a nice way to uh, sort of finish that project for this album with jo- with John, obviously. Yeah, that's the Heaven in Hell A video, Mark. If you haven't seen it. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, have, I remember seeing it when it came out. I actually was going to ask about it, but we got veered off into different directions. So I'm glad you brought it up. Well, it was good fun doing this, guys. It was great. It was good talking to you both. Yeah. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Um, it, it's not often a, a, a speak to an artist and the producer on the album. So this is a first, and it's I really it's came out well, and I really enjoyed doing it. Well, th- well, well I'm th- glad we got to pop your cherry. Yeah. yeah totally. That's cherry pops totally. Are we, are we, John? John, we, are we sort of spit roasted back? Well, I am in the middle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but, no. But listen, mate. Thank you. You know, we really appreciate the support you've given us over the years. It's um, it doesn't go unnoticed. And thanks for having us on. You know, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Not a problem. Well, as I said earlier, I've been looking forward to talking about the album for a long time. Yeah. So I'm glad that it's out. It's great, and. uh yeah, I wish you all the best with it. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Right on. Hey, it's before been... you sign off, the last word that I would say is that, you know, after years of working with these boys, I still genuinely love all of them. And that is rare. <laughs> and you know what, John? The, f- the feeling is mutual. You know, we've, we've worked with many producers and people in the industry, and I'd say 90% of them we fucking hate. <laughs> um, well, it, you know how it is. Like, with it's, John, it's a rare thing to say, wow, you know, I've known these guys for all of these years yeah. and I still like them. Yeah, we, we, we really, <laughs> we really love, you know, we do love John. He's, he's, he's part of our family. We're actually, we're actually a band and it's a family at the same time. I know that sounds a little bit cheesy. It is. Yeah, it really is. And John is a part of that universe, that we're actually universe. He's, he's a very close um, comrade and we love him dearly.